Hey there, Hillsiders. Over the last uh, few weeks, I have been reading through the first couple books of the Bible, um, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses. And one of the things that has stood out to me, especially going through Exodus and then also with Numbers, is the story of Israel after they are being delivered from slavery from Egypt. Now, according to Exodus, we know that uh, the Israelites are in Egypt for about 430 years where they're enslaved. And uh, depending on how you do you do the math, that's anywhere between six and ten generations of slavery. And that can be really hard for us to try and wrap our brain around, especially as people who are from the West, American Christians, to think, you know, what is it like to actually be enslaved or to have a mindset that's been passed down generation to generation to generation that you don't think for yourself, you don't provide for yourself, you don't do for yourself, you don't hope. It doesn't matter what your identity is. Your purpose is work. All these things are just givens to you. And then all of a sudden, a God who you've heard about from your ancestors, 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 all the stories and almost seems like myths and legends, sends a guy who used to live in Egypt, who's now back, and he causes all these plagues to come about, and finally the Pharaoh releases you to go. And seem like the greatest thing ever. You're leaving slavery to go into freedom and to head to a land that's been promised to you by God. And it's a plan, it's a land of provision and it's a land of plenty. But what we find out is that the years of slavery, the generation after generation of slavery in Egypt had really messed with the Israelites. Every time there is a challenge for Israel, as they're leaving Egypt to head to the promised land, the first thing that they do is to say, we should go back to Egypt. Um, God's providing food for them in the form of manna or bread from heaven. And at some point, it's like they're tired of it. And it's like, man, wouldn't it be great to go back into slavery in Egypt where at least we knew we'd eat meat and we'd get vegetables? It's much better than what we're doing right now. And we could look at that and think, how could you be that way? How could you be even thinking that slavery would be better? But the human condition has really not changed a whole lot in thousands of years in that we will often choose that which is familiar versus something that is going to require more or be difficult or beyond what we our, our experience would be. What God was attempting to build into Israel as he led them out of Egypt was a dependence upon him for provision, a dependence upon him for direction, a dependence upon him for purpose, a dependence upon him for sustenance and for life. And rather than just having, you know, here's your work, go do this, here's your allotment of food, your slop on the plate, whatever it's going to be, instead they had to listen to God and listen to his direction. And even to the point of, he said, I don't want you working seven days a week. We're going to be about remembering the Sabbath, keeping it holy, and so you can only work for six days a week. And the other day is a rest day. It's a, de it's a day to celebrate. It's a set apart to be holy and just to be. And that was one of the most difficult, challenging things for Israel to wrap their brain around and actually put into practice was obedience to God's command to be, to be at rest and to not be constantly going. And as I've been wrestling through this, I was talking with Joan, it's like, it seems strange that for a person or people group who are enslaved, the thing that they would want the most would seem to be freedom. But there are so many other things that come along with freedom that can also be challenging. And that's not to say, you know, we want to be a slave. But in reality, when we look at the New Testament, it says you're either going to be a slave to sin or you're going to be a slave to righteousness. And so when God delivers us from bondage and the, the life of sin and the junk and the enemy wants to steal from us, to kill us and to destroy us, he's not just turning us loose to say, go do whatever you want to do. Instead, he's saying, I'm moving you out of here into a place where you're going to be my servants. You're going to be in... in uh, for lack of a word, you're going to belong to me, and I'm going to tell you what your purpose is. I'm going to tell you what your identity is, and it's not going to be about just what you can produce. It's going to be about who you are and who I made you to be. And as I'm talking with Joni this morning over a cup of joe outside, sitting on the patio, looking at the beautifulness of Sparks, Nevada, it really got to me thinking, Lord, let me be a person who is willing to be led by you into things that I don't know yet the places I haven't been, things that are unfamiliar, maybe even uncomfortable, because I really want what you have for me and not just what maybe the, the ease of being in bondage or the known quantity of sin would bring to me. Because 
Those things want to steal from me. They want to diminish me. They want to take away our identity. They want to take away our purpose. And God wants to do the exact opposite. He wants to give us life in all of its fullness. But the cost that goes along with that is reliance upon him and a trust and a faith that is sometimes even harder because we don't always know. We don't always see how things are going to work out. We don't know where the provision is coming from. But we can know and trust that when God's working for us and he's saying, you are my people and I will be your God, that he's got us. And he's got us in his hand, and he's never going to leave us, and he's never going to forsake us. So we can see that it took an entire generation dying out in the desert because they couldn't, they wouldn't. They were physically almost incapable of being obedient to God or following him without complaining and without arguing with each other and without attempting to rebel and go back. It took an entire generation to die off until God raised up Jonathan, he raised up Caleb, and he says, I'm going to lead you guys in the promised land, but don't be afraid, don't be discouraged, because I am going to be with you. And that same promise rests with us today. We don't know all the things that our life holds, but God tells us he will never leave us or forsake us, and the land he's leading to is a land of his provision, it's a land of his plenty, it's a land of his inheritance for us and for those coming after us. And we really are, we're standing for people who aren't here yet. And it's a good thing because our God specializes in coming through. He didn't lead us this far to abandon us. He didn't give us hope for a little bit only to yank it away. Our hope and our trust and our faith is, is uh, situated firmly in him and in his character and in his name. So join me today. Let's call upon Jesus. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your provision for us. We thank you that you are thinking good thoughts towards us. And Lord, where we fear because we don't see what's coming down the road, because we sure of the provision that's happening. We don't know exactly what you're calling us to. And where things are uncomfortable and difficult, we trust you. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Have a great rest of your day.